to have with us today Steve Hollenhorst, who some of you might recognize as the Dean of Huxley College. And he's been here with us for four years. Prior to that, he was at the University of Idaho for 13 years. And then previous to that was for 13 years at the University of West Virginia. So that means he's got to stay here for 13 years, I guess. So there we go. And he's going to share with us today uh, some work that he's been involved with on for the last several years working on biofuels. And you might alert readers of the <coughs> schedule might notice that he doesn't look at all like Rebecca Cole, who was scheduled to be here today. Uh, she had to cancel just uh, two days ago due to uh, an illness in her family. So Steve was gracious enough to step in and fill the, fill the void. All right. Thanks, Steve. So I like doing that kind of thing. So when I can come in and sub or help out like that, I think that's a kind of a fun thing to do as a dean because I don't often time to get to, uh, uh, get to be in front of students like this. So it's pretty fun for me. All right, we're going to talk about aviation fuels today. So to start it off, I want to ask, in the last 12 months, who's been on a commercial airplane? All right. Um, if your flight went from here to, say, Washington, D.C. Or, or to New York and back, the aviation fuel that you consumed on that flight was about equivalent to the um, gasoline you would have used in your car in a year, or about equivalent to the energy a, a, a young girl growing up in India will use in her lifetime. So this is a big challenge when it comes to climate change uh, and what we do about these aviation fuels and how we find a way to get free of fossil, free, of fossil fuels and how to get free of uh, carboniferous um, carbon that, as a source of those fuels. And this project is all about this. Uh, it's, I call it the race for renewable aviation fuels and environmentally preferred products. And keep that EPP part of this thing in mind because that'll come up as we get through the talk. Okay, what I'm going to get through is I want to talk with you a little bit about the climate change imperative around liquid fuels generally and biofuels uh, for aviation, uh, sorry, uh, liquid fuels for aviation in particular. And then I want to talk with you about this notion of using big signs, big huge teams of people with broad backgrounds and bringing them the together with a lot of money to solve these kinds of problems. Okay, now you don't need to take notes. Because if you go to that website right up there, that's my webpage at the college website. I've already hung this up there for you. You're welcome to open it up right now if you want. Um, follow along. Um, but feel free that everything I'm talking about is um, up there. And you can just sort of relax, sit back, uh, watch what's going on. Or you can be more interactive. And you can go to this site um, in that webpage. It's at the end of the document. And these are all live links, and these, this is all of the, the stuff that's been produced through this big science project. You will see, for instance, um, you'll see that there's a, 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 a publication link, and that'll bring you to all of the refereed publications. There's close to 200 refereed articles that have been written through this project, hundreds and hundreds of reports. Uh, gray papers, all sorts of different things. You'll see infographics, fact sheets. You'll see our Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube pages, lots of videos. There's also lots of energy, uh, bioenergy lesson plans, and web webinars. So there's just a slew of stuff here that you could use uh, to follow this project if you're interested. OK, so let's talk just briefly about the imperative for uh, getting free of um, fossil fuel when it comes to aviation fuels. So this is the way the carbon cycle worked pre-industrial revolution. And sorry about the cheesy graphic. It's the best thing I could find. I'm kind of looking around for a better one. So if you, anybody knows of one, I'd love to use it in the future. Right? And you'll see that uh, if you leave off the power plant thing over here, the, what happened was it was just a carbon cycle that involved the crust of the earth. Right? It didn't involve anything down below. But with the Industrial Revolution, we started to remove all this coal and petroleum and gas uh, from the, um, down in the Earth's crust and it releasing it into the atmosphere through power plants, uh, through combustion engines, through industrial uses and that sort of thing, right? And that's why we have more and more CO2 uh, in the atmosphere. The goal of this project is to see if we can do a little bit to just quit taking it out of the ground and instead 
utilize woody biomass. But that would have eventually ended up back into the uh, atmosphere anyway. What I call biogenic carbon that's already in the carbon cycle, right? So we capture those plants, process them, convert them into fuels, then burn them instead, uh, uh, and then they're released in the atmosphere. So in the example of woody biomass, instead of it burning in a slash pile, the idea here is to burn it in a jet engine, okay? I love this graph. Well, let's spend a little time on this graph. This is from Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. These are called Sankey graphs. And what you see here is you can see all of the energy consumption in the United States last year. 97.5 quads of energy. That's actually down a couple quads, 2% or so, from the year before, which is pretty good, right? And there's a lot of things going on in the Sankey graph. Okay, over here you can see all of the sources of energy that we use in the United States. And then you can see where it goes and what it does. What is used for electrical production, what's used for res residential, commercial, industrial, transportation, et cetera. Okay, now let's unpack this because there's a lot of cool things going on here. The first thing is, let's look at the renewable fuels or at least the low carbon fuels. Not all people would call nuclear fuels renewable. Not all folks would call woody biomass renewal, but at least they're low carbon, right? So if you look at all those, the big lesson there is it's still a rather small uh, part of our energy portfolio in the United States, or actually worldwide. Maybe 17% of all energy comes from those sources. In particular, look how little, look how skinny that yellow line is for solar. Isn't that amazing? How little, we hear so much about solar, but look how little that line is and how little solar is actually contributing to our energy needs in this country. Okay, so that's one thing. The next thing is look how much of those renewables go to electrical production, okay? Uh, th we, they're not helping us at all on the, or very much anyway, on the transportation side of things. It's ground transportation, but particularly for air transportation. So that's kind of interesting. And then look at this, the amount of what um, energy scientists call rejected energy. This is the inefficiencies. This is the heat put off by a combustion engine that isn't moving the vehicle down the road, but it's just heat that's given off into the atmosphere. These are the electrons that are just flying off of uh, high tension, long distance power lines, and that the efficiencies that were lost in that transport distance of, of that electricity. And that actually isn't being used to create energy benefit for us. And look at how big that amount is. So nearly 60% uh, of the energy in this country is lost to inefficiencies. It's amazing. So uh, whenever anybody talks to you about conservation as a resource, the idea that if we can make more efficient systems, we can actually um, replace a lot of the energy we would need. It's conservation as a resource, and there's a lot of room for that conservation to happen. Okay, and then lastly, look how much of the petroleum, the liquid fuel, the liquid fossil fuel that we um, mine, that we drill for, goes to the transportation sector. Virtually all of it, right? Transportation is very liquid fuel dependent, and that's why petroleum goes here. The other thing I'd maybe mention about this graph, if you looked at this compared to graphs uh, in, in previous years, you'd see that the coal portion is much larger and the natural gas portion is much smaller. So what's happened in the last decade is natural gas is taking the place of coal, <coughs> which some people think is a good thing. So it's, it's uh, pretty controversial. Okay? Now, if you look at the liquid fuels we do use, about 11, 13 percent of it goes to aviation. Okay? Uh, and that's an important thing to remember. Now, a lot of these things are going to be electrified in the coming years. We're not going to see, I don't agree with these drops that they're showing here. For instance, motor gasoline, I think we're going to electrify our, mo our vehicle fleet, ground vehicle fleet, much faster than that. And we're not going to see uh, that uh, component of gasoline being used anymore because we're going to be running ground vehicles by electricity. All right? Uh, so that'll probably drop. Same with diesel. But jet fuel is a challenge. Now, that's my first place I want to stop. And I want to ask you a question. Why is it that the aviation industry and airplanes are so dependent on liquid fuels? 
Why do you think that is? Why do we need liquid fuel? Why, do we, why does so much of that petroleum go into propelling vehicles to where we want to get them? Yes? It's very storable, right. It's easy to store, fairly safe to store, yes. You guys use a lot more to fight gravity. Say that again? Are you going to fight gravity? So okay. Okay, so how does liquid fuel help you with that? Uh, probably because it works better. How, how is it working better? What is it about its function that's better? You're on the right track. It's, uh, it's, it's denser. There's more energy packed in a smaller amount. Uh, right, so it's very dense. Right, good point. What else? There's more. It's ama it, liquid fuel is amazing. Yes, way back. Very easy to, to what? Refuel. Yes. It's really easy uh, to transport it, and it's very easy to uh, 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 refuel. I'll just call it refuel. P put it in a, f in a tank and, and make it accessible to that vehicle. Right. What else? It's cheap. And one other big thing. You know what? It's actually pretty safe, uh, especially um, paraffinitic kerosene, the kind of thing that is used in aviation fuel. Its, uh, it's uh, flash point is actually quite low, so it's safe to use in an air aviation environment, to put it in a tank and run a jet engine and know that you're not going to blow the airplane up. So it's pretty safe too. It's really magic, this, this fuel that we have. Uh, the only downside of it is it's leading to the destruction of the planet. Bummer, huh? So what do we do? How do we come up with a different re uh, replacement for it? But before we do that, I want to just give you an idea about how dense and how powerful this fuel is. T if you took out your iPhone right now, and if we had a way to replace your lithium battery with uh, liquid fuel, and the best example I could come up with was diesel fuel, which actually it doesn't pack quite the punch that uh, paraffinitic kerosene does. It actually has more energy uh, per weight and per volume than uh, diesel does. You could run your iPhone not for 15 hours, but for 10 days. If, imagine your battery as a little tank, and if you could get a little like a, you know, like a little filler, and you could put uh, uh, liquid fuel into that little tank, and if there was actually a propulsion system, a combustion system to then run a little generator and then run your iPhone, there's enough energy in there to do that for 15 days. 13 times as long as your phone will run. Uh, other examples, if you were, the energy density uh, of an iPhone is 703, whatever those are. Watts? Watt hours. Watt hours? Compared to 10,700 watt hours for the equal volume weight of <coughs> liquid fuel. Pretty amazing. OK, now, where's all that fuel used around here? Well, by far, most of it is used at SeaTac. SeaTac is the big monster of this area, which actually, if we're going to come up with a regional solution for this kind of thing, makes it easier because most of the bi biomass is over here on the west side. The, distance, the haul distances are smaller, and you don't have to ship it uh, to as many places. And there's maybe one more reason why liquid fuels made from biomass um, might be considered a benefit for this area, and that is the whole notion of wildfire. And so we do have forests all over the west that after a, a century or so of fire suppression, we're now dealing with all these fire problems. So if some of those fuels in ecologically sound ways could be removed, and harnessed and put in a jet engine instead of burning in these types of situations, that could be a net, the proposition here is that could be a net ecological benefit for us also. Okay, so in comes big science. This project is called the Northwest Advanced Renewables Alliance, NARA for short. It's uh, 100 principal investigators, 200 scientists, endless numbers of grad students, uh, staff workers, all sorts of folks, all the way from chemical engineers and uh, 
foresters to ecologists and social scientists all working together to try to solve one part of this climate change problem we're facing, and that is what to do about aviation. Because we're not going to quit flying. Uh, you know, that's not going to happen. And instead, the idea in this project is, can we find a more environmentally friendly source of fuel instead? OK, so here's where the team comes from, from a lot of universities uh, in this part of the world. Um, Boeing, uh, Alaska Air, uh, universities in different parts of the country, all kind of coming together, scientists at all these locations working together, Weyerhaeuser, part of the whole thing too. And then one of the first things we had to do is we had to come up with a supply chain and a conversion pathway. A supply chain and a conversion pathway. The current supply chain in aviation fuels and all uh, liquid fuels in this country is from fossil fuel extraction through the, the transportation process, then refining to various types of fuels, and then we put in the tanks of airplanes, diesel trucks, uh, cars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We had to come up with a different supply chain for doing this whole thing and a different way of converting and refining this material because it's a different kind of material. And this is what we uh, ended up on. This is a pretty brutal process. When you have these scientists together, they all have their ideas about how this was going to work. And what we had to do in the first years of the project is try different things. And, and we had uh, phases and gates we had to get through at different points in the project. And we had to make decisions about whose alternative and whose pathway was the best. And when we did, we picked that pathway and we took our dollars and we took them away from all the other scientists. They got shoved off the project and we reinvested it in the people that we were sticking with. That was tough. That was a really part hard, of the, hard part of the project. There were a lot of winners, hopefully because of the merits of the, their work, and there were a lot of losers who went home and uh, uh, after a year or two weren't part of the project anymore. And that's kind of how it works. And think of it as a pyramid, and you want to take your dollars and you want to be as efficient with them as you can. This was $88 million is how much we were spent. And then all of the partners, the money they put in, in the end it was probably more like about 130 million when you consider all the matches. Okay, so here's the process we finally ended up with. The first is we're focusing on forest residues. Forest residues are the slash piles that are left in the forest after they're done with forest harvesting operations. It's not the whole wood, it's that, that wood would have been harvested anyway and it would have gone to higher level uses. We're talking about the stuff that's left behind and that in much of the West is piled up into big piles and in uh, the wetter times of the year burned. Okay? So that's, uh, the that's the feedstock is the term for that that we're using. The next thing we had to do is we had to transport that. Now, if you just take a bunch of branches and leaves and that kind of thing and put it in the back of a truck, you're basically hauling air and water. And that's not very efficient, and you use a lot of diesel fuel to do that. So what we had to do is come up with a way to densify the material uh, before it was hauled in order that we could be more efficient in the use of the fuel that's used in making the fuel, right? So we came up with a whole process of chipping, grinding, uh, screening, and, and then packing this material in uh, trucks so that it could be transported to the next part of the process. That comes, and that's called pretreatment, and that's the process of um, preparing uh, the materials so that you can break down the cellulosic material and remove the sugars, okay? And then we used an enzymatic hydrolysis process, the same thing that's used in the pulp and paper industry, to remove the uh, lignans from the sugars. So if you look at a tree, or, or you look at a, a board from a tree, you'll see that's kind of light colored, but then there are these kind of brown streaks in there, right? Well, all that brown stuff, that's lignin. It's all called lignin. And that's all what makes a tree work. It's what gives it its structure, it's what gives it its hardness, and it's what helps keep the cells together and resist rot and uh, decay from um, bacteria and things, like fungi and things like that are, that are going after it, right? And some trees are really, really good at that. And inside those cells is all the sugars, right? So this is the process of releasing those sugars. It's kind of a hard thing to do, right? And uh, then you get a big pile. You can see down at the bottom, you get a big pile of lignin, and then you get a big hunk of sugar at the end of that whole thing. Sugar's the new oil. 
Okay? And then what we decided to do, in other processes they make diesel fuel and they do all these kind of things, what we decided to do was ferment this sugar into second generation alcohols. Okay? Now you know this process because you've heard of ethanol. And you know that ethanol has been made from corn all over in the Midwest. Well, ethanol is a crappy fuel. And what we wanted to do is go to the next level and find a fuel that worked better. Okay? And I'll tell you a little more about that in a minute. And then once we had that second generation alcohol, and that alcohol is called isobutanol, uh, we could easily, through existing processes that we all know really well, refine that alcohol into jet fuel and co-products. Okay? In the result, we've done a lot of uh, LCA analysis of this whole thing, and we think just that process there and the fuel that's created is about 60% less, uh, results in 60% carbon reductions or higher compared to fossil fuels. Now remember, it's not carbon neutral because there's a lot of energy inputs here into producing it, right? We're using f diesel fuel, for instance, to ship this stuff around. Uh, but in the end, we think it's at least a 60% reduction. And as we use the um, co-products, we think this will go even higher. And I'll tell you about that too. Okay, so this biojet material, it's about $160 billion mark, uh, dollar market uh, in the United States. And that's important because that gives you the economies of scale. That allows you to produce this stuff at the level that you need to to really make a difference. But you know what? That's not where the uh, oil companies make their money. They don't make their money making gasoline. They don't make their money making jet fuel and diesel fuel. Where they make their money is on the co-products. It's all of the rubbers and the lubricants and the solids, uh, solvents and the blend stocks. All of those other things, the activated carbon, all those things is where the real money and the margins are in the industry. So they just make gasoline to scale up this whole process. And then it's these co-products where they really cash in. Okay? So we figured we had to come up with a similar thing, uh, a similar thing with biofuels, and that's where lignin comes in. There's something that people say about lignin. Uh, we've known about lignin for ever since there's been forestry, right? And the saying is, there's a lot of things you can make from lignin except money. People have tried to make money from lignin for years, and it, it, it doesn't really work. So mostly what happens is lignin gets burned in the, in the, in the uh, refinery in order to run the process, burned in the mill to run the mill. But in this project, we tried to show that yes, there is a future and there is a market out there uh, for lignin. And there are some things, even now, where we could make money there. Okay, so this is our biomass. That's what a slash pile, big old honking slash pile, looks like out in the woods. And right now, they'll wait until the first rains in September, October, maybe the first snow, and they'll light these on fire. That's the way that works. And then after we do the treatment and densification process, this is what the commodity looks like. We had to produce an industrial commodity that could be moved around in efficient ways uh, and take the place of oil. Because oil moves around, like the guy said in the back of the room, we had to find a way to create a commodity that we could move around as effectively as they move around oil. And that's what it looks like there. Kind of looks like grain, huh? And we sort of thought about the grain industry and how we move grain around when we came up with this idea. And there's scientists in every phase of this thinking this kind of through and working with their grad students and trying to come up with the model. And then we decided that, okay, we were going to scale this up and use what we call a biorefinery to make this happen. And we think these biorefineries will be about the size of a large sawmill or pulp mill in terms of their size. Uh, and we thought that it would have to be that big in order to produce the fuel that the aviation industry needed. And this is just to scare you. You don't need to know anything about that except that it looks really scary. But that's how the whole process works. This is called an Aspen model. Chemists, uh, chemical engineers do this all the time. And this is the whole process going all the way from those wood residuals and running them through this whole process until we finally get in, into a fuel tank. And then all of this other stuff that comes off at the end and all of the co-products that are made from it that go out that way. So imagine a biorefinery with all this stuff happening, fuel going out that way, co-products going out this way, um, inputs coming in in different directions. That basically is a, 
a, graph, a graphic representation of what that refinery would look like. Um, if you think about it, there's a lot of stuff happening there. And we had to put a lot of thought into how big these facilities would be, uh, where the sourcing of the material would come from, and if we're going to be located in places where we could get that material. And then we had to do all this other stuff related to the environmental and social impacts of that kind of thing in the communities where these refineries go. So we did a little analysis like this. This is kind of a cool little graph, if you look at it for a second. You know what those are? Pipelines. And usually, us folks in the environmental community, you hear about a pipeline, and you got this kind of visceral, visceral negative reaction to, oh, it's a pipeline. Ugh. I'm going to go protest this pipeline. Uh, I was pretty down on the Keystone Pipeline myself. But you know what? Pipelines are the cheapest way, pipes are the cheapest way to move things around. It's so much more efficient than a, a tanker a ship. It's even more efficient than a, a railroad car. And it's even more efficient than, th that's even um, more efficient than a truck. Pipes are just really effective ways to get things around. So we wanted to know where those uh, existing pipelines were. And if we were going to site a facility like this, we had to think about where those pipelines were. So that's kind of an important thing. And then where are you going to put these facilities? So those little yellow and red squares, they represent pulp mills in the Pacific Northwest that are closed. They're just sitting there and they're closed. And we sort of thought, well, hmm, maybe some of those are the types of places that this new green industry could be built. We could build a new green industry on the bones of these old kind of nasty industries. That's kind of the idea. OK, and then the part of the project I led was the education side of the project and the team that was doing education. And what we wanted to do is we knew that half of this problem was a technology problem, that we needed these scientists to go out there and figure out how to make biofuels. But the other half of the problem was how to get society to adopt it. And we figured that was an educational st strategy. We needed to come up with a new, educate a new workforce that could participate in this industry. We had to help people in, in communities understand how a biorefinery could be a good thing for their community compared to climate change, rather than just opposing it. And I found myself in a really interesting position as an environmentalist, because here I was. Uh, uh, on the side of bringing these smokestack industries into communities because I thought it was a better thing than climate change that came with fossil fuels. So it created really interesting bedfellows in this whole process. Here's where we're at right now. We've gone through this whole thing and, we're, and we've actually uh, produced a thousand gallons of this jet fuel from Woody Biomass. And the plan sometime between now and middle of June, is uh, Alaska Airline is going to be flying a commercial airplane that you might be on, you wouldn't know because they don't tell you, from Seattle to Washington, D.C. And it'll be the first time ever that a commercial airplane has flown on energy from wood. So it's from wood to wing, right? And that's the idea. And we call it 1K IPK. IPK is paraffinitic kerosene isobutanol-based paraffinitic uh, kerosene. And watch for it. That'll be happening in the next month or so. Uh, why did we do that? Well, we wanted to demonstrate that we could make every step in the supply chain process work. We didn't do it in one place like a, a biorefinery bio -refinery eventually will. But what we did do is showed that all the pieces were there so that when an investor comes around, they can put those two pieces together and make it all happen in one place. Um, we also wanted to show that the supply chain worked. We wanted to uh, uh, address the needs of our aviation partners and get them involved and actually fly a plane and show that it worked within existing aviation technology. And we just wanted to learn from that whole process. Here were our partners. Uh, we had feedstock suppliers that included big industry like Weyerhaeuser, all the way down to the Muckleshoot tribe. They pr provided uh, biomass from their forestry operations. Uh, we had all sorts of processing partners that helped us create the FS uh, R17 uh, commodity material. And then we had our conversion partners doing the pretreatment fermentation, and then finally the uh, refining of the alcohols, the isobutanol to jet fuel. 
So this is what it looked like on the Confederate Salish and Kootenai Reservation and the slash pile uh, feedstocks that they gave us. And you can see the little, uh, uh, what do you call those things? The conveyor belt that's uh, going from the grinder and the sorter and then putting that stuff into the back of the truck. And that's the way we're densifying this. There's a slide from the Weyerhaeuser Corporation, Lane Forest Products. You know what, when I used to see slides like this, I would get so angry. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a wilderness and protected area guy. And I'd see these forest operations and I, I would just get vi mad. This is bad forestry. Now I look at a slide like this and I'm thinking, maybe, but it's better than climate change. And it's made me really think differently about the role of the woody biomass industry uh, in, in, in the climate change uh, situation we're in. Here's a warehouser uh, demonstration going on. You can see him filling the truck right there. And then the last step of that process is the federal government has to give us the okay. You can't just say, hey, I've produced a thousand gallons of this stuff and then just put it in an airplane engine. Uh, it doesn't work that way. You have to go through all this ASTM approval process in order to do a demonstration like this. So for the last couple months, we've been going through the scientific ASTM review and now we're actually uh, in the process with the board where they're signing off on what the scientists have approved. So that's ready to go. Okay, now the challenge in this whole thing is how do you go from this new invention to the commercialization? Who's going to come in and build a biorefinery like this? Someone give me a guess at what do you think a biorefinery would cost? What do you think your capital investment would have to be in a biorefinery? 100 mil? Good guess. What's that? I think it sounds accurate. It's about an order of magnitude low. It's about 1.1 billion, we think, is what each of these refineries will cost. Yes? Is that like a refinery or we'll, okay, that's a great question. And one of the reasons we've recommended old mill sites and pulp mill sites is that a lot of that infrastructure would already be there. And you could reduce that figure considerably, maybe down into the 700 million range, if you could use a facility like that. If you think about it there, you got water, you got rail, you got, of, oftentimes there's actually infrastructure in place in terms of electrical power, those kinds of things all can help you out, all right? So it's a big investment for whoever's gonna have to do this, all right? So um, these are the different things that they're gonna have to, whoever makes this decision is gonna have to think about. And at our last conference, Exxon was there, Chevron was there, Tesoro was there, and they're all, Mobile was there, and they're all kind of thinking about, all right, is this, is the time coming where we're finally going to invest in this or not? They're also there to protect their existing assets. They're sort of seeing where we're at, and it could be that they're not interested at all, but they're going to make sure it doesn't happen. So that, that's the kind of dance you sort of see happening there. But we have to think about where the forest residues are, and we also have to think about where the municipal solid waste and the construction and demolition waste are. Now think about that. We've gone out into the woods to collect all this material and we're, we're putting all this energy into the densification and the transport of those materials. But think about municipal solid waste and construction waste. That's already been collected. The energy inputs are already there. It's all together. All you have to do is effectively sort it so that the materials you want uh, you can get from the materials you don't want, and then you don't have to add all those transportation costs because you've already centralized it as part of the garbage collection systems that you have in your community. So we're really looking um, closely at that whole possibility. Um, and then there's these other uh, steps in the process too that we have to look, look at, and it's going to be different in every community that thinks about this. Okay, so I'm getting near the end. This is that slide again. It's in the presentation. You can go to the link at the beginning and I'll flip back to that if that helps. Or you can just look my webpage up at the Huxley webpage. And if you want to learn more about this whole project, you can go to any one of those links there and uh, before you know it, you've wasted your whole evening. So, uh, but have fun with it. I, I, I hope you find it as interesting as I have found it being part of the whole project. So. 
I had one more slide. And it's not there. Oh, okay. So let's finish it with this. Should have been at the end. Okay. This is Kuhn's cycle of scientific revolution. It's the idea that, that changes don't happen in little increments. Big thought changes, structural changes have to happen if we're really going to tackle these big kind of problems. We have to go from seeing a problem one way to, to letting go of that and completely going in a new direction. And this is Kuhn's critter here on the side. And to yourself, I want, to th want you to think, what do you see there? What kind of animal, don't say it out loud, what kind of animal is that? Okay, look at it, good, figure out what it is. All right, what do you see? Okay, what do you see? A, a seagull duck. What do you see? Oh. <laughs> okay. Oh. okay, what do you see? Rabbit. You see a rabbit. You see a rabbit? Yeah, I see it. All right. So what Kuhn tells us, if you see a duck, try to see a rabbit. Or if you see a rabbit, let go of that and try to see a duck. Try to approach these problems completely differently. Let go, to, let go of those old assumptions and use your science to create a new world. That's what he's asking us to do. Okay, there's the connection if you want to look up the presentation. And I'll quit there, and we got time for questions. Yes, right there. Could you all hear the question? Are, did we consider using agricultural crops? Um, so there were two parts of this project. Uh, there was $88 million, $44 million of it came to our team, led by Washington State University. And the other $44 million went to the U of du University of Washington. And they did agroforestry. They did purpose-grown agricultural things. We decided to focus on forest residuals. It was kind of interesting. Before that, USDA, all of their money went to corn-based ethanol production. They were doing all the research on that. And we finally, as a scientific community, and uh, actually a social, social community, we decided ethanol and corn is a bad deal. It's not working. We got to divest our, our research energy from that, and we got to try something different. And they invested everything. Their whole budget that year basically came to these big cap projects out here in the Pacific Northwest. One on forest residuals, our project, and the other one on purpose-grown um, aspen, uh, hybrid aspen, uh, and genetically engineered aspen that were grown down by Boardman. And their idea was they were going to try to grow a crop to do this. And they were pretty effect effective at, at finding ways to do that. Uh, and they were going to harvest the whole aspen tree and use it uh, in their project. Their, they had a harder time with their uh, conversion process compared to what we did because they had a different species. And every species is different. It's kind of like wine, right? If you have a every kind of grape you have, there's a different bacteria that reacts with that grape and, and those sugars in different ways, and that's why it tastes different, right? Well, the same is true in this case is what we're finding. So they had trouble with that. But there are people who think that if we harness the agriculture system and we grow this stuff specifically for fuels, it'll be a more efficient way to go. There's a counter thought to that, though. And that counter thought is, is that you don't want to compete with food. Right? The last thing you want to do around the world is be creating liquid fuels for rich people to fly around in airplanes and diverting those fields and that ag production uh, capacity away from food production for, for poor people. And that, that, that debate is kind of playing out right now. I think it's a great question. I know. <laughs> so, because there's been a lot of history of biomass facilities starting up in Oregon, and there's been a lot of criticism around them, that in fact what they're doing is they become, that we're not talking about residuals, we're talking about the forestry um, product itself becomes the input into these biomass facilities. Right. And therefore they've been very controversial because of that. Right. I'm wondering if you could speak to that with respect to this type of project. 
Sure, there, and it, it goes beyond that. So the other criticism there is that uh, by incentivizing this work in the forest and by taking these resources out steadily out of the forest that the, uh, the health of those forests will be depleted over the long term. And the place you start at looking at that is the soil, right? If this material isn't decaying away and going back down in the soil, soil productivity and soil nutrients over time could uh, go down and the whole health of that system could decline and crash, right? That, so I, those are really uh, important concerns and we heard those in all the meetings we've gone to. Um, and in the past, when I wasn't thinking about climate change, I would have been sitting on that side of the aisle with those folks with those exact same concerns. But now I come into the um, argument with the climate change crisis on top of us too. And in my head, I have to weigh two things. I have to weigh what is this doing to our forests compared to what fossil fuels is doing to our climate. And I'm trying to do a kind of a calculus about what's, what's better. And I don't know the answer in the end. I think it's going to be different for every community. But I think we have to be thinking, um, uh, I ha think we have to bring the climate dimension into those conversations. I'm not saying that it is the best solution. In fact, I don't think we know exact that it is actually. We've, our studies on soil productivity show that at the level we're removing materials, we don't think anything is going on. That, that's what our scientists are saying. But that, we've been doing this for five years. You know, and what's it going to look like in 50 years? And what's it going to be like if this is a slippery slope and for now we go in and take residuals, but then all of a sudden they're going in and the, every 10 years they're harvesting the forest before it's mature, like has happened in Appalachia with pulp mills. So I'm, I, get those, I get those concerns. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you if you divide forty four million by thousand gallons, it's pretty expensive. Um, and this is proof of concept, and, and we admit that. Um, when we, we the calculations our economists have done is we think that we can uh, current conditions. Uh, if you put a plant up and the conditions were right, you could produce the stuff between three and 350 a gallon, which is still a premium compared to the current cost of aviation fuel. Um, so it's much more expensive. The military said they'll pay it. Now why would the military say that? Why, is it, why are they willing to put in security? security? They want to be, they want to be, have uh, energy independence. They want to know that they're going to have a source at home that they can go to um, if everything goes hell, to hell in a handbasket. So they want that diversity. The commercial airline industry has also said that they want, will pay a premium to get this, to stand up this industry. Why would they say that? Because they want competitors with the oil companies who now basically have them over a quote barrel, right? They, they have no options. So the airlines have to buy from the oil companies and the airlines hate that. So they see this as a way uh, to create some competition in the feedstock side of the industry. So I think you're right about price. It's going to be important. It's really put a, like a, a wet blanket on this whole project because when we started it, um, oil prices were much higher. We felt like that we could kind of get some traction. But currently, uh, it, no one's going to make a $1.1 billion investment, I think, with, with where oil prices are. Yeah, right. Okay, so co-products, uh, lignin. All right, it's a great thing. There's a lot of things you can make from lignin, except money, they say. But um, we've been working with a lot of things. Plastics are one real important thing. We've been exploring different nylons, uh, cellulose-based um, um, things. You guys don't remember, but there was a kind of wrapper, cellulose wrapper that used to be used, um, and we're kind of going back to those kind of. Um, decompostable kinds of pro green products and we think that there will be a market for those kinds of things and we'll continue to develop them and we have some example products and you can see some of those at that web page. 
but the one that was developed now that we think there's a really big market for and that we could jump right into that supply chain is a non-fossil fuel source of activated carbon. So virtually all the activated carbon in the world is fossil fuel based, right? And we use a lot of it. We use it to scrub our power plants. We use it to purify our water. What are some other uses of activated carbon? It's everywhere. It's a really important. It has such great functions, and it's hard to have a, a, a bio source of that. Well, lignin, it's very easily to easy to convert lignin to activated carbon. Um, it's a multi-billion dollar uh, global market, and all of it is being supplied on the, on the fossil fuel feedstock side. So we think we could come in right there and have a really green source of it. Good question. A few more minutes. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> so play that out. What do you, what do you mean by that? They were sugar. I, I wish there, uh, if there were like a paleoecologist, maybe someone here could tell us the way uh, carboniferous forests worked. When the, all that was being laid up, um, lots of carbon was produced during that period. But I don't think we're pr current forest systems are producing carbon that, it, that it's re being created like it was during that period. Do you know the answer to that? I think th this is what I've read. I don't know this for sure. And I think the reason is, is because the bacteria and the fungi that break down cellulosic material evolved later than did those trees. So there was a several, like a several tens or hundred million year period when uh, that material did not decay. That's my understanding. John, if you could find that out for us, that'd be pretty cool. I, but I've heard that we are not creating that, th those forests anymore, that those sugars are not being converted to oils like they were then. It's kind of curious. I heard the term on the radio. I listened to this program called Grillery. It's called Coast to Coast. And I heard the, uh, <coughs> an advocate come on about determining the oil with an A dot I uh, uh, origin instead of Oh, the way it was created? Yeah. Uh, the earth uh -huh. itself creating it on a continuous basis instead of just a finite supply of it, like a lot of people think that eventually we're going to run out of oil. Right. But I've heard this term, A by I. Huh, interesting. Well, I know. That is a, it means a continuous, indefinite supply. Yeah. Maybe tropical forests are doing this. I don't, I don't think so. I look at the soils in the tropical forests I've been in, and they don't, you get a few inches down, and there's nothing happening there. So I, it just seems like we're in a different time ecologically than when these, these, these fossil fuel deposits were created. Peat, peat bogs, and, and peat is still being created but I, I, I don't, in, an, in that kind of environment, but I don't think it's happening from forests. Okay, I hope I've given you something to think about. I hope you're leaving here thinking that maybe the duck is a rabbit and maybe the rabbit is a duck uh, and that these problems, maybe the solution's a little in a different space than I thought it was um, before I came in the room. Thank you.